Matthew chapter 13. Let's, uh, glad to see you, Andy. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord, uh, what would you say to us if we'd really listen? And would you present yourself to us in such a way that maybe for these moments, because of prayer and because of the overshadowing of your presence, we would be forced to listen? And would you cause us tonight, by the power of your Spirit, to comprehend what we might not otherwise comprehend, that we would shove aside, could not be shoved aside, and what we might sidestep, we could not sidestep tonight? Because your word, empowered by your spirit, does something to us and in us that we just can't shake. And no wonder the scriptures, you, you call this whole process that we're involved in tonight the foolishness of preaching. Because who could convince anybody, who could argue anybody into, who could change the mind and the heart of anybody? And the answer, of course, is no one but you, so... This is your deal, and we give ourselves to you for the proclamation of your word tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're dealing with the parable of verse 31, chapter 13 of the book of Matthew, verse 31 and 32, which is the parable of the mustard seed. I want to read it for you again. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. When a man, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is sown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Uh, one of the things I've been trying to convince you of is the connection of this parable and these parables in chapter 13 with the uh, events that have been taking place in chapter 12. All of chapter 12, of course, is taking place on the Sabbath day, and it's just simply an overwhelming controversy that's going on. If you would go back with me to chapter 12 and look at verse 1 and 2, Jesus, it's on the Sabbath day. Again, all of this is taking place in one day, and this controversy is very strong. The disciples in verse 1 are hungry. They begin to pick grain and to eat, and the disciples, and when the Pharisees saw it, they said, look! Your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. Jesus immediately leaps into the, into the scene and says, Hey guys, you're nitpicking. God doesn't care. God simply does not care that they're picking grain on the Sabbath day. In fact, he said, let me give you an illustration. And he gave the whole illustration of David stomping into the, into the tabernacle and eating the showbread, which was absolutely for no one except the priests themselves, and God didn't care in that occasion. In fact, the priest, wow, he breaks the Sabbath day law on a dozen occasions on the Sabbath day, and God simply doesn't care. In fact, he says, what is God interested in? Verse 7, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Wow. You guys, he says, are not on the same page that I'm on. You don't have the mind of the Father. You don't think like God thinks. You've missed it. You would have thought that would end it, but it didn't. They went down to the synagogue, and they set a trap for him. You'll note in verse 10 it says that they asked the question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him? And they set before him a man with a withered hand. They knew he couldn't resist. They knew that. He just couldn't keep from doing it. He just had to heal the guy, and he did. And when he got done, he turned to them and said, Guys, a sheep falls into the pit. What do you do on the Sabbath day? Get that sheep out of there. A man falls into the pit, has a withered hand. What do you do? Leave him alone. He can wait till Monday. Why do you do that? Sheep has value to you. A man doesn't. You don't think like I do, do you? We're not on the same page, are we? You don't have 
the mind of God. You've missed it. At that scene, at that end of that scene, they, in verse 14, went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. In other words, they went to the conference room, got around the big oak table, uh, conferred together, stuck their heads together, consulted together, and they plotted how they're going to, it's not if we're going to kill him or if we're not, it's how are we going to do it. And they're after him. And in response to that, in response to that, what does Jesus do? He goes out, grabs the multitude. How many there were? We don't know. We would guess in the thousands. And he took them out and he healed all of them, it says. So while they're plotting murder, Jesus is healing. You don't think like I do, do you? You're not on the same page I'm on. You don't have the mind of the Father. You think in terms of murder. I think in terms of redeeming and healing. You don't think like I do, he says. They come out of their conference room, come and see this great multitude and all the miracles that Jesus is doing, and then one more is done that would be typical of all the miracles he did, casting out a demon, and they immediately leap to the occasion and say, oh, he's full of the devil. He's in league with Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And Jesus said, guys, come on. You don't think like I do, do you? We're not on the same page here, are we? A house can't be divided against itself. If I'm casting out demons by the power of the demons, then a house is divided. Come on, guys. What are you doing? We're not on the same page. You don't think like I think. You're not into the mind of the Father. See, you're trying to take, he says, a tree and say, oh, the tree is bad but the fruit is good. <laughs> well, miracles are good. Hey, all the deliverance of all these people, that's great, but oh, bad tree, that's ridiculous. You're trying to say, oh, good tree, bad fruit, that's impossible. Bad tree, good fruit, that's impossible. You can't mix it, people, he says. So if you're gonna say my fruit is good, say my heart is good. We're not on the same page, are we? We're not reading the same book, are we? <laughs> you don't have the mind of the Father, do you? They swallowed a couple times and came down to verse 38 and said, hey, we want a magic trick. Do a sign. Convince us. Come on. Make the walls fall in and then rebuild them. Jesus said, guys, you want a sign? What do you think I've been doing? All of these miracles and you want a sign? All of this healing, and you want a sign? What do you think every miracle and every, what do you think the withered hand, the healing of the withered hand was all about? It was pointing you to the Father. And you want me to do a sign? I'm not playing your game. But I will grant you this. I'll give you one sign and only one sign, and that is going to be the cross. And he told them about the prophet Jonah, which they knew. We're not on the same page, are we? We don't think alike. You don't have the mind of the Father, do you? Got away from the crowd, went into a house. They all came. The house was so crowded that when his mom and half-brothers came and stood outside and wanted to talk to him, they couldn't get to him. So they sent a messenger in, and in verse 48... Jesus answered the messenger who said, your mom and your half-brothers are out here wanting to talk to you. Jesus said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Hey, guys, we're not on the same page here, are we? You're not my mother. You're not my brother. You're not my sister. We don't have any linkage at all, do we? We're not on the same page. We're not reading from the same book. We don't think alike, do we? You don't have the mind of the Father. What am I going to do with you? So he went out by the seashore. 
Crowds begin to gather, and he began to tell parables. A whole shift in his ministry. And the disciples were so aware of the shift that they come in and said, what are you doing? He said, hey, I just spent a whole day with these boys, and we're not on the same page. I tried to convince them. I tried to preach to them. I tried to lay it out for them. I tried to tell them, and they just... I don't know what to do with them, but I'm not going to give up. I'm going to tell a bunch of stories, which in these stories will be everything about them, and maybe they'll wake up and, whoa, he's talking about us. So he told the parable of the sower and the four soils. Then he told the parable about the wheat and the tares. And then he came to this parable. No explanation for this parable. Doesn't need one. He's talking about those boys. He's just gone through that day. This relates directly to that occasion, that day, trying to get through to the people who aren't on the same page. Now, in verse 31 and 32, there is a principle, and we've been trying to walk through this principle. And it has some aspects to it. One aspect that we spent about three Saturday nights on is the aspect of the movement. See, in the parable, there is the kingdom of heaven is a movement. It's not stagnant. It's not, oh, I got that. It's not, well, yeah, I went to the altar 25 years ago. It's not that, see. It's not stagnant. It's fluid. It's moving. It's alive within you. It's a seed, people. And this seed is on the move, and it's growing. And what we try to emphasize in this movement is there is a connection between the two. In other words, is it, the seed is related to the least, and the, and the uh, tree, the, uh, which is greater than the herbs, is related to the greatest. So he's, he's comparing least and greater, seed and tree. But it's not disconnected. In other words, a dime is greater, is, is smaller, is least, is much least than the cloud, but they're not related. That's not what he's doing here. The least somehow is all connected to the greater. In fact, there is no greater if there isn't a least. In fact, the least is going to become the greater. In fact, when the least is finished, when we're finished with the least, it's going to look like the greater. In fact, the greater will look like the least because the least has become the greater and they're connected. Did you get that? And there is no possibility of greater without least. And this is an explanation of everything he's been saying up to this point. It's back to our Sermon on the Mount. It's the poor in spirit. It's the, it's the helplessness. It's the least stuff. It's the I can't. It's, the, I'm, it's impossible. It's the I, I am what I am stuff. It's the hey, here I am in the leastness of who I am, the helplessness of who I am. And he comes in his overwhelming resource. And in that merger, you got to get the merger thing. Not in the touch. He touched me. Thank you, Bill Gaither. Not in the touch. In the merger. In the merger. In the filling. In the infiltration. In the fusion. In the, what's the word for you? In the essence of the power and spirit and nature of Jesus. Literally penetrating your mind, your heart, your inner being, your inner being, and merging with you, a new creature is created called the kingdom of God. So the kingdom is not a place to go to. It's not a location. That's heaven. The kingdom is a relationship with this person in intimacy that somehow takes you out of your leastness and brings you into greatness but all the time, you know, it wasn't you because you were least and, and you become, that's the parable. So who becomes greater? The least guy who will open 
to the merger. That's his whole principle. So this is a movement of him and you merging, cooperating, moving together. Are you in? Yes. Whew. Wow. What a possibility. The movement. Now, let's come to not only the movement, let's come to ministry. There is no question that in the parable, remember where this comes from, chapter 12, the whole controversy, what he's been trying to get done, he's been ministering all day long, criticized for that ministry, and comes and tells this parable. Obviously, they're not on the same page. Obviously, they're not thinking alike. Obviously, they don't have the mind of the Father. So, Jesus tells this parable, and part of the concept of this whole least and greater seed and tree stuff is all saturated with the idea of ministry. And I know this is really going to turn you on, so try to contain yourself. See, the focus and climax of everything he's saying in the parable ends up to say, well, look at verse 32, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it becomes greater than the herbs and becomes a tree. It doesn't end there. This is not, I became a tree. No, no. I became a tree so that which covers, colors the whole least becoming greater thing. So why have I become greater? The tree so that birds of the air come and nest in its branches. What's that all about? Oh, it's all about safety. It's all about a place to go. It's all about nesting. It's all about dwelling. It's all about, hey, this is a refuge. It's all about, it's all about saving. It's all about healing. It's all about, whoa, you know why the least became greater? So that you could be an instrument of healing, redemption, saving, refuge. People could hide in you. Your disciples pick grain on the Sabbath day. That's not a tree giving a dwelling place for birds. Oh, withered hand healed on the Sabbath day. Should have left him the way he was. That's not a redemptive tree bringing refuge to a man in need. Go to the conference room. How are we going to kill him? What? Why aren't you out at the baller, dude? Healing. Refuge. Saving. What's your problem? Well, he's just in league with Beelzebub the devil. What? So you're going to look at a refuge. You're going to look at a place to nest. You're going to look at healing. You're going to look at saving. You're going to look at redeeming. Say, so, eh, full of the devil. You want magic tricks? And I want you to be a tree that is a refuge for the need of your world. We don't think alike, do we? <laughs> We're not on the same page, are we? You don't have the mind of the Father, do you guys? What's wrong? Come on, Pharisees. What's your hang-up? What's your hang-up? So you see, he tells this parable. And why is he telling this parable? It's all out of this chapter 12, which is trying to give them insight into themselves and how they think and how far off track they really are because they aren't close to being a tree, refuge, healing, saving. Now, there's three ideas I'd like to develop with you out of this ministry thing. Not a chance tonight. 
One is comparison. Two is connection. Three is the content. Let's start with a comparison. There is definitely a comparison. If this is all about ministry in the passage, if this is all about ministry, and I think it is, the overall thrust of the concept then becomes about you, the least, becoming the greatest in ministry. That's a contrast. Least, greatest. It's a comparison. He's comparing the seed with the tree, which is all about ministry. Now, there's a trap here. I don't know if I can walk you through this or not. Probably have lost some of you already. It's all okay. It's all right. But I'm trying, to, I'm trying to discover it in my life. See, the comparison, when you come to compare ministry, at least, greatest in ministry, our mind just automatically, how am I going to get you not to do this? Our mind just automatically goes to what we do. See, my ministry is greater. Why? Because I'm full-time pastor. I get paid the big bucks to do this. And I do it all the time. You are just laymen, so maybe you minister once in a while. Therefore, your ministry is least, mine is greater. Based upon what? What I do. That's the way we think, right? Now, even in the realm of full-time, hey, I'm a full-time minister, therefore my ministry is great. But even in that realm, there is the least and the greater. See, there's those who have small churches, those who have big churches. Obviously, the big church guy is greater than the least church guy. But even in the big church guy, there is least and greatest because there's the big church guy, but then there's a big church guy who's on TV. But even then, the guy on TV, there's... See, it just goes on and on. It's, folks, the politics of ministry. Least, greatest. Let me give it to you in the language of the Church of the Nazarene. Here's missionaries. They are next to God, and you don't mess with them. Then there are general superintendents. Six of them. Then there are DSs. Then there are pastors. Then there are laymen. And then there is roadkill. And then there are evangelists. <laughs> Woo! And we go from least to greater. See, we think in those terms. But when you come to this parable, that's not what he's talking about because ministry is not contained in what you do. Oh, I teach a class. Not what we're talking about. Oh, I sing. No, well, they won't let me, but I would. They, that's not in, that's not here. That's not in the passage. Well, I'm an usher. We don't have any. So that doesn't apply here. That doesn't apply here. Well, I put the carpet down on the floor. Woo! That doesn't apply here. What you do is not what he's talking about. Although, don't get confused now, ministry always does. <laughs> well, you just said it wasn't doing. It isn't. Because it's not the measure. And yet ministry always does. But you never measure ministry by doing. There's going to be a test at the end of this service. You may not get to go home. Did you get it? Okay. That's really important in the passage. So when we say ministry and we say comparison and we come up with least and greater, we think in terms of doing so the guy who does greater, oh, miracles. I've never done a miracle. That's not what he's talking about. What is he talking about? He's talking about least is connected to a seed. 
greater is connected to the tree. But the two are connected because the least becomes the greater. So ministry is found. In fact, he uses the word, look at it, in verse 32. But when it is grown, in other words, as this seed interacts with the divine presence and does this merger thing, when your life is filled with Jesus and Jesus really gets inside of you and there is, and you're just, and you're helpless and you're least, hey, that's okay. But as he merges with you, he begins to, in, through his resource, begins to build a destiny in you that takes you to tr a tree limb. That is ministry. Well, what'd you do? We're not talking about what you did. Well, is it preaching? We're not talking about preaching. Singing, not talking about singing. Well, I witnessed, not talking about witnessing. Although all those things are good, but it's the seed interacting with the resource that now takes you to your destiny of the tree. And in that process of becoming the tree, you become the rest, you become the resting place, you become the nesting place, you become the refuge, you become the healing, you become the... And it isn't anything you did, on, uh, although you did lots of things. It was that experience, that intimacy, that process of him working in your life. And your focus was not on ministry and what am I going to do? It was focused on the flow of his life fulfilling his destiny in and through you. And ministry was almost accidental. Just to prove to you that I'm totally an idiot and I don't know what I'm talking about at all, I found this in Matthew 28. Same thing. Same thing. Amaze me. It's the Great Commission. Jesus has died, raised from the dead, came back to his disciples, had an appointed time with them at the mountain in Galilee, and when he got there, the disciples came, uh, they worshiped him, and he turned to them and gave them the Great Commission. And here's the Great Commission, verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. That's the Great Commission. Go, therefore. Now, you all know that the word go is not a command. It's not an imperative. He's not commanding you to go. You don't have to go. Relax. You're okay. Don't go. It's all right. You don't have to. Because it's not an imperative. The imperative is make disciples. What he commands you to do is make disciples. The going is assumed. The going is a participle and it's assumed. It's assumed you're going to go. Why? You've got the driving power. Well, you're a seed and you've merged with him and he's going to create his destiny through you and you can't help yourself. It's just so natural for you. You just got to, you just burn in your bones, don't you? You just can't contain it. Whoa. So we don't have to say, come on, people. Come on, come on, come on. If we have to say, come on, people. Come on, come on, come on. Then we got a spiritual problem and you're probably not Christian anyway. Because the Christians burn in their bones. Why? Because they're leased and they've merged and with the resource and they're becoming trees and their destiny, his destiny in them is being fulfilled, which is ministry. So then going is no problem. The problem is make disciples. Interesting that we don't have a word for that. So we said make disciples, but we don't have a word for what the Greek says. It's a combination of two ideas, believing and seeking. And those two, which is the least and the greater kind of combination thing, see? It's the, oh, I'm giving my life to Jesus in total, absolute, invoking the activity of the second party. And when I invoke the activity of the second party, he merges with me and I'm seeking his will and he's just spilling his life through me and I'm becoming a tree. That's the disciple concept. But we didn't have a word for it, so we used the word disciple. And we said, make disciples. But here's what's interesting. Are you following this? Four times this word shows up, disciple thing, this, 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 what, whatever that word is, that four times it shows up 
in the scriptures. And every time outside of this one, it always has to do with being a disciple, not making disciples, being disciples. You can read it in the book of Acts. You can read it in other places. Always talks about being a disciple. Just go out there and be a disciple. Just be a disciple. Just be a disciple. The whole focus is on being and nothing is stated about doing or making. When they came here, they translated make disciples. Wouldn't it be interesting if this is not, he's not, this is, he doesn't want you, wouldn't it be interesting if he's not commanding you to go out and make disciples? Oh, I got to make disciples. How am I going to do that? Oh, get video series. Oh, that's it. We'll take him through the video series. And at the end of the video series, we'll give him a button. You are a disciple. Are you a disciple? No, lost my button. Oh, my. Is that what he's talking about? Now, wouldn't it be interesting if this passage, the same as the other three passages, the focus is on being a disciple. Wouldn't it be interesting if what he's saying is, go! I know you will because you got the burn in your bones and you're just going out there and you just can't help yourself because you're leased and you're becoming a tree and you've merged with me and this whole flow is taking place in your life and you're just going to go out there and be a disciple. And if you'll go out there and be a disciple, you know what will happen? You'll make some. Ministry will take place. Can you imagine you're going down to your job, just being a Christian, just being a disciple, just he, he, you're the least and you're becoming a tree and, and lo and behold, the guy working next to you is repenting of his sins. You say, hey, whoa, what are you doing? Repenting of my sins, giving my life to Jesus. Well, don't do that. I haven't witnessed to you yet. Wouldn't that be interesting? Wouldn't it be interesting if the whole deal of ministry is not how many, how much, how big, how great, how... I have my own parking spot. Wouldn't it be interesting if ministry was all about, I'm least... But he has come in his overwhelming greatness and he's merged with me. And in that merger, there is a flow that is taking place in my life that is bringing me into tree status. He's fulfilling his destiny in my life and I'm just, whoa, and I'm seeking him and it's all kind of happening. And out of that process, out of that experience, out of that happening in my life, lives are changed. Ministry takes place. Hearts are moved. And I become a refuge, a place of safety. <sighs> Are you a place of safety? When turmoil is filling the life, can I go to one place I know for sure where I can just be in peace and calm? And it's you. I can come to you. When guilt overwhelms me and I just feel, oh, I'm, I'm filthy. Where can I go? But nobody will say, I told you so. But will embrace me and share. Is this crazy? Share the load of my guilt with me until I can release it to him. Are you that way? That's the dream for the cross tile center. A place of safety. Well, it's not. May be true, but it's the dream. 
It's what we intend. And it's got to happen. That's the dream for the church. A place where we could come and say, oh, I can belong here. You got it? Yes. Least. I can't minister. I can't teach a class. I can't sing. At least they won't let me. I can't. But he comes. And in the embrace, merger, fusion, his life, my life, his nature, I begin to think like him, see like him. And in that process of merging with him, in that experience of merging with him, he begins to take me into tree status. And the destiny, his destiny for my life in him is fulfilled. And it's called ministry. (laughs) Oh, I want to minister, Jesus. I spent all this time in school getting ready to minister. I took counseling courses. I got educated God. I took speech classes. I I went, oh, just, I want to minister. I want to minister. I want to minister. And maybe it wasn't about smarts skills, techniques. Maybe all the time was about you in my life, fulfilling your destiny in my bones. And while I've been in competition, trying to out-preach others, trying to out-sing others, trying to have churches bigger than, trying to be more famous than, jealous because I wasn't on TV while all of that was going on. Could it be I missed the whole deal of what you wanted to do in my life? And somehow, Jesus, I think this applies to every single one of us here tonight. Because we're all least. And the individual says, oh, I can't minister. There's no minister going to come out of me. I got too many of my own problems, too much going on in my life. I just, hey, I, I just, I, I don't have time to minister. I got to focus on myself. Could it be that will destroy what you want to do in their lives and any salvation they might experience? Could this all be about you and me getting together in such oneness that you can take me into the fullness of your destiny, which is ministry. In the name of Jesus, give us some trees. In the name of Jesus, Give us some trees. Some safe places. Some people who are refuge. Safe harbors. They're so full of you. Ministry is just who they are. Heads are bowed. Whoever you are, wherever you come come from, God has a destiny for you, an overwhelming plan. He doesn't have an instruction manual. He is not a road map. He is a person who wants to embrace you. And 
in the embrace, fulfill his dream in your life. Would you let him? Would you let him? Would you let him? You fulfilled your own dream. Would you let him fulfill his dream? You've gone your own way. Would you let him take you his way? You've thought your own thoughts. In the context of our passage, you've nitpicked. You, oh, picked grain on the Sabbath day. You've gone and plotted murder. You've Would you be the least tonight on your knees? Letting him take you into his destiny, a tree. Moments of seeking. Moments of seeking. Want to join us?